You're listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Vuelta a España in association with Rafa. Celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today we are in Cuenca. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello. And Fran Reyes. Hello, chaps. And the familiar question, well, I should say before we go to the familiar where question. Where is Lionel? Where, well, where is Lionel? Watford. Watford, of course he's in Watford. He's back, he's left us um, to continue his holiday in Watford, I think. But uh, we, we were played in there by the sound of Fran at the finish. Uh, quite a twist to today's stage. You were waiting with uh, Yetze Ball and his manager, I think, at the finish, waiting to see whether he unexpectedly had the red jersey of race leader. Exactly. And we would hear there... Adrián Palomares counting the seconds. Adrián Palomares is the current master of Manzana Postobón. And you know which race he won in 2008? Oh, here we go again. <laughs> no. Come on, you should know. The Tour, Tour of Portugal. Ah! Oh. Tour of Britain, the Tour of Britain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah, Puerto yeah, Ventura yeah, yeah. Canarias, the latest iteration of the Vicente Veldas team. Sorry. Fran, I don't know much about Manzana Postobón. I thought you were going to say you don't know much about the Tour I don't know much about cycling. No. <laughs> um... Um, I know, but the other day I discovered what Postobon is because I had some Postobon grape juice in the press room. Yeah. It's tremendous. Yeah, Postobon's been around in cycling for years. Yeah, but I'd yeah. forgotten. That they, so that's a, is a supermarket? Uh, no, Postobon is one of the biggest soft drinks uh. companies in Colombia. You okay. know, they indeed pertain to a bigger company called RCN that is a giant media empire there. Well, listen, a lot of people will be wondering how a Dutchman, yet Ball, ends up on a on a tiny Colombian team. And we will actually hear that story later in this episode because Fran spoke to him a few days ago about that. So we'll hear an interview with Yetzi Ball a little bit later on in part two, I think. But where are we, Fran? Well, we are in the beautiful city of Cuenca, one of the, as I, as I, as I perceive them as a Spanish, is one of the dullest cities in the What? whole country. But yeah. it's one of the most beautiful places in Spain, hands down. Going to Cuenca and finishing where we finished today at the at the bottom of the town um, on a completely anonymous street, it reminds me of the time that I interviewed Marcel Kittel at the Arctic race and he was wearing a cap, so I didn't get to see his magnificent hair. <laughs> we went to Cuenca today and we didn't see the magnificent old town. Yeah, the, Truly one of the jewels of Spain, come on. Yeah, it's tiny, it doesn't have a huge university, it doesn't There's no have Movida. a huge anything. There's no Movida, the dance floors are small, I know that, Fran. But <laughs> it is beautiful. I tell you what, it's um, the, the drives are inland. It was it, it's in the middle of nothing. I mean, the, it it's was. It's La Mancha. It's La Mancha. Yeah. You know, one of the main characters of the Spanish literature is Don Quixote. Okay. So Don Quixote got really crazy, and do you know why? Because he was from La Mancha, and there is nothing to see in La Mancha. But it, it's it's very beguiling. Isn't it? It's kind of inspiring. It's kind of beautiful. It's kind inspiring. of inspiring. Ble yeah. Bleak and beautiful. Um, very arid, and and uh, it's also Louis Ocaña. I was going to say, around, not for very yeah. long though. What age was he when he? moved to France. He was uh, 10 or 11, 12 when Luis Ocaña moved to France. He yeah. spent most of his formative years in France, I think. Anyway, um, in the absence of Lionel, uh, Fran, can you give us, I've, I've passed over this responsibility, can you give us the tale of the tapas, please? Yeah, I first was meant to fill in for Francois Tomaso, now I am meant to fill in for <laughs> Lionel Bernie. These are big shoes to fill. Yeah, I, I, I'm afraid that tomorrow I'm going to do the podcast big alone. Big clothes to fill, maybe not big <laughs> shoes. Sorry, Lionel. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the uh, seventh stage of this Vuelta a España from Giria in the inlands of Valencia to Cuenca, right in the middle of La Mancha. It was a quite flat stage and with a lumpy finish. Breakaway took a bit to be conformed because Team Sky didn't want a big group with meaningful riders for the GC to get away. Finally, a four team man breakaway was established. Among those we had uh, usual suspects such as Jets Ball, Alexis Gouillard or Pavel Podiansky, the guy who was second yesterday in Puerto de Sagunto and I think we will hear of him later. Matej Mohoric, Slovenian rider for UA Emirates, was the one to get away for, with the victory. When they reached the decisive part, which was the climb up to the Alto del Castillo in the center of Cuenca, a nice cobalt hill, Matej Mohoric took the responsibility to trim the group and reach the top of the climb with another three riders, Jose Joaquin Rojas from Movistar, Thomas Degen from Lotro Sudal 
and the aforementioned Poljanski. Right after the summit, he took advantage of a tiny gap that was formed, maybe a 10 meter gap, no more, and rode away in impressive fashions as the rest of the breakaway companions looked at each other, hesitating. Matej Mohoric sealed the victory, Pavel Poljanski coming in second, and Jose Joaquin Rojas taking the third position. Meanwhile, in the bunch, there was not much history, only a bit of tension because of crosswinds that led to some crashes that took out of the race two of our Pedal of the Charm contenders, Marawi Kudus and uh, Larry Warbes. I don't know if you guys have anything to say, but for me, it clears the path for a victory in that contest for <laughs> Brack Jack Hay. I, I think I think you can still win it, even if you're not... I mean, uh, Larry Warbas is a very resounding victor. Um, I'm actually... A, a Pedal de Charm t-shirt is actually winging its way to the hospital where he is at the moment. So we're. I always refer to him as Lucky Larry, but he was a bit unlucky <laughs> today, wasn't he? But lucky if he's stolen the, the, well, the Pedal of the Charm. No, 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 sure stolen. Well, not literally. It's a democratic vote. I mean, he did get the support of some real big beasts, as I said. I mean, Andy Hood, Tail Gagan Hart, Kayleigh Fretz, they all, they all weighed in for, for Larry. So he was a very, very, perhaps the most convincing winner ever of Pedal de Charm. Uh, is that the tail finished, Fran? Any, oh, any I, I, think I think we. Uh, but you keep interrupting me. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it was, was ad libbed. Did you notice that? It, it was, was very It was like being at the podcasting equivalent of a rap battle. It was like Eight Mile for podcasts. It was incredible. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so, <laughs> yeah, you can rap it. You can sing it. Uh, you can put it to a Beatles tune in future episodes. I think. Yeah, I, w- I will get back to that. I mean, yeah, I, I am yeah. Can, we can work on that. We can work on that. Very but unconvincing um, impersonation of um, Lionel. There wasn't it because it was far too factually accurate. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So far, don't, don't worry. I will. I will make up uh, Chris from Attack now. <laughs> on, on, on that note, we should say that there was a bit of a bit of an error last night. Uh, my fault, actually. I have to take responsibility for this. It would be great to blame Lionel now that he's no longer here. But I told Lionel beforehand that um, Jenny Moscon missed the Italian Championships due to his suspension from racing. In fact, he came back. His suspension ended just before the national championships, and he did win the Italian time trial. He did ride the team time trial tonight in a on a special bike and, and all the rest of it. So should have known that. Bit of an error. Sorry about that. But yeah. you know, just continuing the sixty percent accuracy. Yeah. The bar anyway. is set very low. Sorry, Fran. Yeah. Anyway, the bunch reached the bottom of this Alto del Castillo climb together. It pretty much nothing happened because a uh, Sana rider tried to pull and create some confusion, but. In the end, a 40-man strong group get to the top of the climb and they peacefully reach the finish line. So Chris Froome kept the leadership of the GC, David Villela keeps the mountain classification and Matteo Trentin, the points one. So peacefully, in fact, that Chris Froome was asked in his press conference tonight whether he admired some of the scenery, some of the landscapes, whether he got, ever got a chance to look left and right, you know, um, or, or remove his gaze from his stem, which he's constantly he's constantly looking out and um, taking some of the surroundings. He said, indeed, he does sometimes, which you know was I thought was nice to hear. We used to get that question in the early days of Lance Armstrong's domination at the Tour de France. I remember American journalists were very fond of asking him that whether it was a big part of his Tour de France experience, taking in the rolling hills of Provence and. Well, it was it was towards the end really beautiful. I mean, we we saw an unfortunate incident on the cobbled climb with a motorbike um, taking out Raphael Rice. Yeah. Rice, is that race, race. Uh, we saw a motorbike taking out Raphael Rice. We'll hear from him in part two. Um, but uh, uh, the part I couldn't really take my eyes off the screen and and the sight of Mohoric uh, descending to the finish. I remember th- him doing that in 2013 at the World Championships in Florence. He won. He won the junior world title one year and then the under-23 world title the following year. And I remember he appeared in the press conference. He was a very, very articulate young guy. He was 19 at the time. Uh, and I think a lot of people thought this guy is the next, the next big thing. You know, he, he looked to have it all. And it's taken him a good few years to really find his feet in professional cycling. He's, had a, he's been around a bit. He was on the Cannondale team for a bit, wasn't he? And uh, he's joining Bahrain next year. But this was this is his best performance, best win as a, as a pro, isn't it? Yeah, and he has been a, a pro for a very long time now. Well, this is his fourth pro season, isn't it? And he's almost been kind of written off as a, as a faded prodigy or someone who has not really lived up to expectations. And, and that's overlooked the fact that he's only still 22 um, and has slowly come into his own over the past couple of years. He rode a very good Giro last year, I remember. And um, you mentioned his descending technique, Rich. Um, 
I asked him about this at the finish and um, he was very responsible. It was like a public health message. He said, yes, I do do it sometimes, but you know, you, people watching at home mustn't adopt this style too often. I only use it in extreme circumstances like today when I wanted to or I needed to um, win. Win, win. <laughs> exactly. But he did. I think, I think it's safe to say, I think it's fair to say that he did pioneer that technique in professional cycling. It's been credited to... Uh, Michal Kwiatkowski, Chris Froome, but I think Mohoric got there first. Peter Sagan as well has done it, hasn't it? We've seen him descend like that. He's come up with a good name for it. It's kind of like the... Yeah, I mean, I I, I pointed out on on Twitter, it's a very position, very similar to the one that Graham O'Brien adopted back in the 90s um, with the the sort of arms coming coming up to the armpits almost. It it looks very uncomfortable. Not everybody would be physically capable of doing it, I don't think, but it doesn't doesn't look safe. The bike doesn't look stable like that. There's going to be an accident at some point. I mean, if I had to... (laughs) descend like that, sitting on the top tube, I will probably die quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, on that light, breezy note. Oh my goodness. Um, also on Mohoric Rich, um, that reminds me, tonight I called Adam Yates Saddam because I was halfway through calling him Simon and then I corrected myself so then I called him Saddam. <laughs> <laughs> he, found that, he found that quite funny, fortunately. <laughs> I promise I will henceforth refer to him as Saddam Hussein. Um, anyway... Mohoric is also a very clever, articulate chap, as you mentioned. And in fact, it was something I heard quite regularly or on numerous occasions in the first couple of years when he was a professional that he wasn't going to cut it as a pro rider because he was too smart. <laughs> too smart. I think our source might be the same for that little anecdote. But yeah, he, he was almost too thoughtful, too, too intelligent, too much of a thinker. I'm not sure. I mean, I think he, as you say, is still only 22. And, and he showed today great talent, what he's capable of. I'm not sure what sort of rider... He's going to become, but it takes takes some riders longer than others to develop. And it's an interesting career path that, uh, oh, well, he did do one year as an under-23, but turning pro when he was mm. 18, it, not too many guys have done that over the last few years. Our friend Pippo Possato was a sort of test case in Italian cycling. Um, and look how that and, turned well, out. Well, yeah, look how that turned out. And that was a, a very <laughs> contro- controversial precedent that he set by skipping the under-23 category completely and going from juniors to pros. And that was criticised at the time. And, you know, some people did say that that damaged Pozzato. And, you know, he's never really recovered from that as he, as he sort of suns himself on a beach in Ibiza. But... Um, it, you know, Mohoric has taken a few years to come to the boil and, you know, you do wonder whether he perhaps should have spent a year or two longer as an under-23. Maybe ultimately won't matter now. He seems to be on the right track. But I don't think it's for everyone that, is it? And we've talked about this before and we talk about it quite regularly. Pro racing simply doesn't suit some outstanding amateurs they come in and um, no one really can predict that you know you, you look at the talent they have you can look at the the sort of numbers they put out in a lab and you think they might be perfect for it but they simply don't adapt to the I, style of race i think the problem with a guy like that such a prodigious talent winning junior and then under 23 titles to, to then become accustomed to not winning to not being one of the best is is a very hard adjustment and it's it's a credit to him that he has stuck with it for four years in, in the sense that he's obviously exercised some patience and, and he's not lost his head. I've spoken to him, I think I spoke to him at the Giro last year and, and the he rode the Tour either last year or the year before in the Giro, one of the years, and I spoke to him at both and I was, I was struck again by how level-headed he seemed despite the fact that the results weren't coming yet. And um, now that he's got this, who knows what he might go on to achieve. Another man of the day was Pavel Polyansky as he was yesterday, the Bora Hansgrohe rider, Polish rider who tweeted a picture of his legs on the eve of the race, didn't he? And alarmed some people with the, the veininess. The was the oh, sorry, it was at the Tour de France, yeah, with the veininess of his legs. Was it? God, time is just sort of uh, concertina for yeah. me. But um, anyway, he was uh, second yesterday, second again today. He's obviously in great shape. I shamelessly mentioned to him that, of course, yesterday saw a Polish one too, as we'd seen a few weeks earlier in Marseille, <laughs> as if. I sort of realised that all along. When obviously, I had to be corrected for that last night. But anyway, here he is at the finish um, after yet another second place. I try for sure, but I, I think so now. I need to some days rest, like tomorrow and and Monday we have rest day, and I'm ready for uh, second and last week for sure in this Vuelta. You're obviously in really good shape. Yeah, uh, from beginning of Vuelta, I have had some stomach problems, but day by day I start to feel better and. And I have in mind this this victory also from from this morning, 
I go to Breca only for for win the stage because second and third place is not not interest me. But but yeah, today Moric is is going really fast and but the Vuelta is still long and day by day I start to feel better. I mean, we're commenting on the Polish one-two in the stage yesterday. A few weeks ago, we had a Polish one-two in Marseille in the in the time trial at Tour de France. There seem to be an awful lot of very good Polish riders at the moment. Yeah, we have we have Rafa, Michael, we have Kwiatkowski, and uh, I think so. The Pol- Polish race is coming more uh, more with spot strong, and the season okay is not, maybe not so long, but we have also a championship, and I think so. Kwiatkowski or Rafa can win this race, and yeah, we look forward. But but Pol- Polish riders is coming day, but year year but year coming stronger, and I'm happy about this. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thanks to Science in Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. You can get 20% off at scienceinsport.com if you enter the code CPAUG20. CPAUG20. 20 um, for all your sports nutrition. Um, now, in this part, uh, Daniel's had to, to rush off, but he'll join us again at the end. Um, but you spoke a couple of days ago, I mentioned this already, to Yetzi Ball, who, mm. of all the right, I mean, he has been a bit of a breakaway specialist, this, this yeah. Vuelta, but he went very close to taking the overall lead today. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Aren't you the Yetzi Ball specialist? Weren't you the guy who wrote a book on Yetzi Ball? <laughs> uh, no. No? Oh, okay, you saying both. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry. Oh my God, Fran, have you been rehearsing that? That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had been thinking of that for awful. the whole day. Oh, that's awful. Oh my God. <laughs> anyway, he went very, very close, and you were standing with him at the finish as he he finished the stage, yeah. and then obviously waited to see whether he would have the the red jersey. And it was about forty. I think he's about forty six yeah, seconds. Yeah, forty seconds shy of getting it. You know, he was actually quite anxious. You could you could tell because he wasn't talking to anyone. Even if there were some journals with his mics on his mouth, he won't open it. He was just looking at the clock, staring as the muscles and the general manager of the team were counting as the clock ticked. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it, and as soon as he realized that he wasn't bound to be the red jersey of the Vuelta, he just jumped on his bike and left. You know, even even if the teammates and the team members tried to crack some jokes on him mm. in order to hear, cheer him up, he just ignored them and well, went straight it, to the Well, it bus. would have been quite a story had Manzana Postabon taken the red jersey, the smallest team in the race, by some distance. I mean, their team bus is literally like a school bus that's just been painted in the in the team colours. Um, nothing fancy about that whatsoever. Uh, they'll certainly have the smallest budget in the race by some distance. We want to do a little feature on, on the team, actually find out a bit more about the team. Um, and Fran is our man to do that <laughs> over the next few days. But as I said, you did speak to Yetzi Ball. And let's hear his story. How did a Dutchman end up on a small Colombian team? Here he is. Yeah. Uh, my manager is Spanish. And uh, he had uh, good contacts with the team already last year. And they were looking for European riders with experience uh, that also speak a little Spanish. So, yeah, it's uh, the way how I ended up here. Uh, my wife is Mexican and I live in Girona. So one-on-one is two. <laughs> and that uh, made, uh, made it a good situation for me. Uh, I met her uh, in Mexico and there are a lot of Mexicans in Mexico. <laughs> no, I did uh, well the Chihuahua in 2009 and afterwards I did uh, Criterium in Cancun. And by that time she was also a cyclist and it was a woman's race and I met her and I fell in love. Romantic. <laughs> Great. Yeah. It, it, I mean, your career has been catches the eye how you have went down from the World Tour. Yeah. Up to the uh, to continental level now up to, pro, to yeah. pro continental again. What uh, what did you just seek in the world tour at the first place? What did happen? I think I just needed some more times to find out how everything worked. Uh, afterwards, maybe uh, I haven't gave it all on that level, but that was more because I didn't know how to give it all. You get wiser by the years, let's say it that way. And uh, apparently, I needed some more time to uh, find a way to perform the best. I'm happy I can can show it now. Great. 
Um, I, I'm, I see you quite slim, and I thought that you were a bulkier rider, yeah. more experienced suit. How, how come? Have you developed a new talent as a climber? Uh, yeah, well, that's also maybe a reason why I'm uh, performing way better now, is because I dropped some kilos. Uh, and that took me some time as well to, uh, to find a way to, to be the best rider I can be. And uh, yeah, well, I focus this year more as, uh, as ever on it to, uh, to drop some weight because I know with this team I will do a more Southern European program while I was yeah. m normally more used to the, uh, do a Northern European program or Belgium, Holland, Northern France kind, uh, kind of racing. So I knew it would be in my own favor to, uh, to be a little lighter. And uh, I worked hard on it, and I'm happy uh, I've done that. Yeah, you know, and after all, coming to a Colombian team, it makes more or less sense to become a climber, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, not really the, what they expected from me when they signed me, I think, but uh, they are happy with the way I evolved. So there we are, Yetsi Ball. I mean, uh, uh, quite a, a, an odd story, but, you know, this is his shot window, isn't it? This is his chance to maybe catch the eye of, a, of one of the bigger teams and get back into world tour. Yeah, you know, actually, well, he had spent some years on Bacansway and then climbed down to the team, the Chica Cycling Team, the Richke, a continental outfit. And he was going to net a, a post in the Rompot Orange team by winning the top, top competition, which is an amateur challenge composed by, I don't know, 10, 10 or so race in Holland. But when he was going to actually win the competition and get that contract, he decided to give it away to a teammate on the last race. Listen to Kilometer Zero, our morning show at the Vuelta España, by becoming a friend of the Cycling Podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. It, it doesn't really exist in any other sports, does it? Eh? Uh, well, I broke my derailleur somewhere, and I just remember everybody was gone. I was like, now what? But then you find so many fans, and I just gave a pair of gloves to a guy, and he just brought me, brought me to the finish in his own car. I definitely remember... Uh, there were some cookies in the uh, Liège broom wagon, and we were all just crushing the cookies and everything else we could find. It seems like kind of a depressing place to be. Well, normally we don't say so much. You just think about uh, yeah, what went wrong while you're sitting in the bus um, and just hoping to get to the finish line and uh, to go home. And every day uh, they call me, call me, hey, come, come inside, come inside, but no. I think that's it's the really last option to go into the broom wagon. The broom wagon is the vehicle that lurks on the shoulder of the last man on the road, ready to sweep up any stragglers who can't go on. No one wants to finish their day by climbing on board and riding to the finish in silence, but sometimes it's the only option. Nowadays, the broom wagon at the Grand Tours is more symbolic than practical because it really is a last resort for the riders. We heard there a little, um, a little advert, basically, for Kilometer Zero, which is available at the Vuelta to friends of the podcast. Become a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. Today was our third at the Broom Wagon, speaking to a few riders about the Broom Wagon, um, stories from the Broom Wagon, etc. I did enjoy Steph Clement's story about being in a Broom Wagon with Christian Moreni. Um, but uh, that was released Friday, and on Wednesday it was Lucho, the story of Luis Herrera, the Colombian who won the Vuelta a España in 1987, first Colombian to win a Grand Tour. And on Monday we did a feature on Aqua Blue Sport making their debut here. Uh, six more episodes still to come, so do sign up to become a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. Now, there was another little thing of interest that happened today I mentioned it already Fran but um, something else happened today Fran unfortunately an incident involving Rafael Rice the Cajarral rider who was in that breakaway he was hit by a motorbike uh, it's happened a few times on the Vuelta you went and spoke to him at the finish I think his response to that will surprise some people um, but here's what he had to say what a nice day on the breakaway wasn't it yeah, it was a really hard day. It's uh, really hard to catch the, the breakaway. In the start of the race, uh, we're going really, really fast, and uh, finally I can uh, catch the, the breakaway, and um, I'm really happy with that. 
Yeah. But yeah, so it was a really, a really hard day. The hot weather and the, well, the rhythm it was uh, fast. Yeah. But yeah, in the final climb, yeah, I, I was bad luck with uh, with a uh, motorbike, but it's things from the the race and. Well, what what happened there with the motorbike? Yeah, I go on the left side in the in the well. It was um, yeah, in cobbles. The edge. Yeah, yeah I, I go in the left side with uh, the edge of the, yeah. the edge of the road where there yeah, are not but cobbles. That, yeah. that, that part finish uh, and I I go to the right side to catch the, again the, the the good road and uh, a motorbike uh, kicked me out. Had this ever happened to you? No, on no, no, race? no, 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 no. This is the, is the, the first time. Well. The, well, sometimes the, the the motorbikes going really well. I don't know fast, but yeah. uh, well to pass the the guys and but today <laughs> bad yeah. luck. That's it. Yeah. yeah, the things from the race and the, well, bad luck. But uh, how that, why did this thing happen on the Vuelta, especially because it seems like it, it, there has been a streak a string of accidents in this in the Vuelta España with related motorbikes. Uh, I don't know what. Uh, that, that's things that, that things passed and uh, pff, I don't know uh, there are humans uh, we are humans and uh, we do mistakes and uh, that's it after all the point that Rafael Reis make is that this is an incident just a race incident you know it's quite um, unfortunate that this has happened so many times at the Volta España but at the same time you know whoever who covers cycling races can see that these kind of incident or at least close calls are quite common between cars, motorbikes and cyclists. I mean I thought it was very very gracious of him to to say what he said and to not be more annoyed about it and to not blame the, the, the motorcycle pilot. As you say we have seen a few incidents like that at the Vuelta over the years and, and this week I think there have appeared to be quite a lot of motorbikes getting in the way especially Thursday on that narrow road and the narrow climb and descent where Guys were coming back from the breakaway. The the, the bunch led by Contador was going very fast, mm -hmm. and then uh, nobody wants to see that. And um, I don't know if it's if it's worse here at the Vuelta or or not, but um, it is an issue. It can have tragic consequences. So, you know, it's great to hear him be very magnanimous and, and gracious and and forgiving of the incident, but um, it's it's not a nice thing to see. But how, how can we address that issue? You know, how can we address this issue? You know, how can we solve this problem with cars, motorbikes and bicycles sharing the space of a road race? Because after all, cyclists are, of course, focused on competition. But as, as they are, all of them are focusing on doing their job as good as possible. And, you know, it's almost unavoidable for some kind of accidents happening the the only thing one can do is to have the more the most skilled people possible driving the motorbikes driving the cars and driving the bikes so to avoid things but other than that what would you suggest to improve the current situation fewer motorbikes fewer vehicles i mean a radical a radical suggestion uh, from a, a sports director i've heard is to to get rid of the convoy and to only have neutral service behind the race because traditionally, uh, sports directors have sat in cars and, and followed the race. It's very difficult to do that now. Um, you'd actually, they'd actually be better following the race on television in, uh, in, in team buses and so on. Having been in the convoy, it's a miracle to me that more accidents don't happen behind the race rather than at the front of the race. I mean, we see the near misses and the and, and sometimes the, the sort of the crowded nature of the roads when the, the motorbikes and the bikes all get a bit too close at the front. We don't see what happens at the back. And, and believe me, it, it it's worse back there. But I think there are too many, often, often too many vehicles, too many motorbikes, too many cars. The Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind. Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kits and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa for sponsoring the cycling podcast. I mentioned Peller de Charme earlier, Larry Warbass, a very convincing winner of that head of Marhawi Kudus. Um, unfortunately, both crashed out today. But Larry does win Peller de Charme. I mentioned that the t-shirt is winging its way to him. Um, and if you want to own a Pedal de Charme t-shirt, go to rafa.cc or go to the shop at thecyclingpodcast.com. Um, now, 
we're going to hear from a couple of writers who are who are struggling in this part. Um, Yeli Wallis uh, from Lotte Sudal, who I spoke to at the start today. He finished well down again today, but he's had a couple of terrible crashes. One of them, there's a clip of one of them where uh, a bidon just appears from nowhere and it catches his front wheel and he goes down like a, a sack of cement. I mean, it, it looked very, very painful. I was watching him at the start. He could barely move. Um, he was very stiff, but he posed for lots of photos, signed lots of autographs, um, and seemed to be very kind of uh, um, in very good spirits, which uh, which was impressive. Um, I spoke to him at the start. I spoke to Connor Dunn at the finish. Aqua Blue Rider, who lost his teammate and captain uh, Larry Warbass today, and both of them, it's fair to say, are struggling. Um, let's hear from them now. It just gives another perspective on the race. Almost a week in. Uh, first, Yelly Wallis, and then Connor Dunn. I have very much pain, but uh, I want to arrive in Madrid. But yesterday it was a hell because of uh, the racing very hard. Uh, but I survived, and now today I will see how it happens, and uh, hopefully I survive again. Are you sleeping okay? Yeah, the sleep is okay, but uh, on the bike I can uh, accelerate, I can... Uh, Everything is uh, on the saddle, and uh, that's uh, the most problem. Uh, if the pull is on accelerate, I need to do my own tempo, and I hope I come back. And uh, so you can't get out of the saddle. You're moving very stiffly off the bike as well. Do you feel more comfortable on the bike? Yeah, but I have uh, bruised ribs. I have a bruised uh, wrist, and uh, also my ankle is a bruised, and uh, that's the problem on the bike. But sitting and uh, a good tempo, it's okay, but uh, acceleration is too much. Your crash of the day, have you seen the video footage? There's a bottle. You hit a bottle, didn't you? Yeah, the bottle comes into my front wheel and I crashed. Very heavily. And the day before, I crashed at uh, 3K to go, also heavily. From the bottle is the left side uh, of my body hole open and uh, the bruised things are from uh, the first crash. Amazingly, you're still smiling and you're you're giving photographs and autographs there. You seem to be still in, in good spirits. Yeah, of course. I I had a good condition and I, I want to be in a, a break week and I uh, maybe I make it to the last week and then we see. Uh, I hope I make it to the first rest day and then uh, my body can recover more and uh, we will see then. A disappointing day for the team, Larry. Going, where were you when the crash happened? Were you aware of it? Yeah, I was actually like 20 wheels back. Um, it was a really fast moment because we came onto this fast road in a crosswind and uh, everyone was like sprinting for the wheels and then I saw a big crash ahead and uh, I was far enough back to avoid it. But then when I came around, Larry was on the floor looking pretty bad, to be honest. They looked pretty dazed. So, uh, yeah, immediately I thought that didn't. Look, that was a bad one, you know. So I felt really sorry for him. And then uh, we heard he wasn't back in the convoy and then we heard he, he was out. So pretty gutting for us because he's kind of our, uh, our big rider in the mountains and uh, one of the more experienced riders on the team. So, and he's also a real great guy. We were hoping he'd do well. Um, so yeah, really gutted for him. Amazing how quickly things changed. Yesterday he was up there in the break and, and today he's out of the race. Yeah, it's just how savage the sport is really. It's like kind of uh, everything has to go right for it to go right um, and, uh, how are you a week in almost a week into your first Grand Tour um, yeah okay it was a super hard day for me yesterday um, I was like on a bit of a bad day and then it was just a super hard pace so I was just suffering a lot of the back just holding holding on and I was just doing everything I could to survive that day and got through okay in Gruppetto so I was proud of that but took a lot of mental strength <laughs> are days like that harder because everybody knows about the big the big mountain days but days like yesterday seem to ca catch a lot of people out are they mentally especially even harder yeah i think yesterday it was just so hard um because we were like other guys at the back just suffering on the climbers we'd be at the back and then on the descents it was super hard so we'd, i was doing like a lot of my max sprints on the descents just getting out of corners and things and oh it's just relentless just uh never ending and uh yeah i think it looks easy on the tv <laughs> but oh that was one of the hardest days i've had yesterday um and was today a little bit better yeah like i had a bit of a bad moment this morning before stage um just <laughs> yesterday you 
I had to dig so deep, I was like, I really didn't know if I could do it again in my head. And uh, luckily I got some good teammates, gave me some wise words and uh, just got on with it and the legs were actually okay. And uh, I got through it okay, did what I could, saved energy, ate a lot of food and uh, yeah, got through it okay. So the body's okay, just uh, keeping the mind strong is the toughest bit. Um, but uh, yeah, the fight goes on. So we heard from, from two riders there who are struggling. I think this is a particularly hard moment in the race, if you like, uh, almost a weekend, still waiting for the first rest day. And I think yesterday's stage, Thursday's stage, it caught a lot of people by surprise, just the, the, the brutality of it. Yeah, it's been a quite a hard week, you know, and I can only feel for a guy that has also suffered a crash on the very first minutes of the race was Jorge Arcas for Movistar team. He crashed hard on the team time trial in Nîmes and uh, he is walking like a robot and he, when you try to talk to him and make a conversation, he can only say it hurts, I can move my back, I can I can see, I can watch the right side, wherever and I can only feel empathy and I can only feel bad for him. No, I think it has been a very hard first week, Fran. You know, we were just talking before the podcast as well about this sort of trend, this vogue for a lack of time trialing or lack of, you know, just one individual time trial in this race. So that, for a lot of guys, that effectively cuts down their resting time because they, they do treat individual time trials particularly as almost as rest days. Where, And, you know, if they look at the road book for this race, they can turn over page after page after page and all they'll see are days when it could be possibly be very hard and it's going to be very aggressive racing and you know there are so many inexperienced riders in this race so many first time and so many young riders 60 odd um under 12 or 25 or under so yeah you know, i'm sure there are a lot among um them who are really suffering and it's a good, it's a long old road to madrid isn't it it is now daniel were you going to give us a little uh, a little glimpse into tomorrow's stage well, tomorrow we've got a, it's perhaps too much to say, it's a legendary finish for the Vuelta, but it's certainly become pretty well known in the last 15 years. Um, Fran, I will go to you for the perfect pronunciation. It's the Soret de Cati, del Cati. Yeah. Soret del Cati. Del Cati. Yeah. Um, and it's a very, very steep climb, typical Vuelta climb. I think it's about two kilometres. I did it for a couple of years ago on, well, three or four years ago on a folding bike, actually. And <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, humble brag who, alert. Who, <laughs> um, managed to get up. Typical Vuelta climb you know pitches uh, slopes of up to about 18 19 percent and um, it's going to be spectacular this climb is very much linked to the legend of Chava Jimenez um, one of the great climbers the last 20 odd years um, in the Vuelta and in fact there's a statue commemorating what is it one or two of his victories and um, just beyond the summit Chava Jimenez was a regular winner of stages in the Vuelta protagonist in a great battle with Abraham Milano in 1998 Yes. When their wives got, their respective wives got involved and it got very messy. Imagine if Twitter had existed back then. Well, it was very, very reminiscent of all the 2012 Tour de France and with a, you know, a slight sort of um, social media fisticuffs between um, Kath Wiggins and Michelle Froome. Where, well, you know, they were slightly upset with each other, weren't they? Um, that was reminiscent of Chava Jimenez's wife and Abraham Alana's wife in 1998 at the Vuelta. I think one of them, I think it was... Ab uh, Alana's wife had a, a slot on the radio, on national radio, and she was using that every day as a platform to sound off. Exactly. It was mostly a story built because of, there was so much radio coverage in the world of Spain in the late 90s. There was kind of a war between the main Spanish stations in order to get the best possible coverage of the world of Spain. And that led to a lot of talk shows being centered on the race and the pressure, especially on Abraham Alana's wife, was immense during those final weeks, those two final weeks of the Volta España, because Chava Jiménez was a more popular rider. He was a climber, attacking guy, irregular, a genius, Jimenez, so to speak. Uh, can I dare I say Jimenez had Peddler de Charme. Cycling podcast existed at the time. He would have been a he shoe in a thing up. for yeah. Peddler de Charme. I was Charme. reminded of a great story I once heard about Chava Jiménez the other day when we were in Andorra, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is 100% true. It's probably one of those great cycling stories that's been slightly embellished, but I, I remember a Spanish colleague telling me that in one edition of the Volta a Catalunya, um, he showed up to the start one day in Andorra. There was a stage starting 
in Andorra and the team, it probably wasn't a team bus back then, the team vehicles parked up, Xavi Jimenez disappeared, um, much in the same way that we saw Pippo Pozzato disappear um, into, into the West End of London at the Tour of Britain a couple of years ago and come back with Dolce & Gabbana bags and so forth. But Xavi Jimenez went much further than that. He disappeared for half an hour and he came back with the keys to a Ferrari. Oh, <laughs> that, that typical Chava, you know, yeah. as far as I, can, as I can tell, yeah. A terrible postscript, though, to the Jimenez story. He died um, just months before Marco Pantani, it was the end of 2003, December 2003. Yeah, in, in not dissimilar circumstances. So, you know, one of the tragic stories of, of modern cycling. But we should wrap things up for tonight, chap. Sorry to end it on a, on a sort of downbeat note like that. But uh, we Big should... Big transfer, isn't it? It's, we've got a long We're drive. basically going back to where we started We've today. got a long drive now, two and a half hours, I think. So that's all for tonight. Thank you very much, Fran. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, chaps.